everybody, I'm Dan Furr and welcome to a beginner tutorial on Serum. Now I know there's a lot of tutorials out there on Serum, but I'm hoping this one can be a little bit different and, and that it'll just explain things in a slightly different way that just might resonate with a few people a little bit more. So hopefully that's the case. Now in order to first understand what Serum is, we need to think about what it is at its core. And it is a wavetable synthesizer. So let's take a basic look at what wavetable synthesis is. Now I'm not going to be able to explain this in full full detail because there, there can be a little bit more we go into it, but I find the easiest and basic way to explain it or think about it is the fact that it can turn a two-dimensional wave into kind of a three-dimensional one. And what I mean by that is it's not just one static wave. When we think about a subtractive synthesizer, we see just this two-dimensional wave shape that sort of goes up and down and up and down. But with, this, but with a wavetable synthesizer, we can actually see if we click this wave in Serum, it opens up this whole extra table here, which we can scan through. And we can actually see that there's 256 different wave shapes within this, what we call a wavetable. And what Serum allows us to do, or what a wavetable synthesizer allows us to do, is scan between those 256 or those varying different waves within our wavetable to morph the sound into something that's either more or less harmonically rich. And we can see visually, again, if we look at the 2D wave, how it changes as we morph through this wavetable position. So the simplest way to think about it is it's just a way to morph between a wave shape in your oscillator to change the harmonics of the sound. Now that we've discussed what wavetable synthesis is, let's take a look at how to navigate through some basic sounds in here. So for starters, we can hit these arrow keys to scan between our presets or our pre-made sounds. Or we can hit this little drop-down menu and choose them manually through this list here. Just that easy. When you look at the top of Serum, you notice these four tabs up here. Oscillator, Effects, Matrix, and Global. And when you click on them, the UI changes a little bit. Now, I'll be going over them in a little bit of detail throughout this video, but mostly focusing on the oscillator tab, because that's where all the important stuff for beginners really lies. And in the more intermediate and advanced videos, I'll go over all of them in a lot more detail. But realistically, most of the important stuff lies in this oscillator tab, and you can find it all here. Now, in order to reset the synth back to its base or default setting, all we have to do is hit Main Menu, and init preset or initialize preset. And what that'll do is bring us to a default sawtooth wave with none of the parameters are enabled, which I find is very good and easy for learning what these knobs actually do. The first thing I like to do when thinking about any synth is really what are the sound sources that create our initial sound. And in Serum's case, we have oscillator A and oscillator B, which are copies of each other that just function independently. We have a sub out, and we have a noise out. So we have four independent sound sources within Serum. So let's take a look at the oscillators. And since these are direct copies of each other, the knobs on here are completely the same as here. So if you understand one, you understand both of them. So to turn the oscillators on and off, it's just this button here. And we can scan through the wave shapes the same way we scan through patches, either through the drop down menu or through these little arrow keys here. Now let's just go ahead and pick this little monster wave shape. So there we go. Now we have our simple wave that we've, that we've chosen. And in order to change the pitch, that's what these sections are all here. So octave, semi, and fine tuning, those are all various ways to change the pitch via a fixed amount. So octave will go up an octave. Up or down an octave. Semitone will go up one note on the keyboard. And fine tune will go up ever so slightly between the notes in the keyboard. So they all function on pi the pitch of the oscillator, but do it in a fixed amount depending on which knob you're choosing. Then we have this chorus tuning here, which allows you to change the pitch without any fixed amount or just completely independent of anything. And it sounds a lot more smooth and fluent, as you'll see.
you can see it automatically just allows it to be a lot more fluent and smooth to travel up and down the pitches, which can be very nice. Next, we have this unison detune and blend, and these knobs all kind of work together. This unison allows you to add or subtract the amount of voices or the amount of notes, essentially, that this oscillator can create. Then we have the detune, which allows you to stack or spread them apart to make them, you know, consistent or different in tune. You know, more in tune or less in tune, depending on how much detune. And then the blend knob will sort of make it focused on more the detuned or more the core noise. So as the blend is at zero, we're hearing much more of the initial pitch and the initial sound. But as we bring the blend to max, we start to hear more of the, the wide detuned sounds, as you'll see. So you can see adding the detune and the extra notes, essentially, allow you to create a sense of width in your, in your oscillator, which can be really fun. Next up, we have this wavetable position knob. And what this does is we've already kind of looked at it. Remember, it allows us to scan through the varying wave shapes we have in our wavetable. So it'll go from 1 to 256 and all the way back one to the other, allowing us to change the harmonics of the wave, as we can see, we move this knob, the wave shape actually changes. Here we have our warp type amount, and we're not going to look at this too, too much in this video because it's more of an intermediary concept, as well as the phase and the random here. But, you know, I encourage you to test it out and try around. Just click the drop-down menu, click some varying options, and, and listen to how they sound and see which ones you appreciate. Then we have pan and level for the oscillator, which just pans it left and right and brings the volume up and down. Easy peasy. Next up, we have the noise section, which essentially allows us to add noise to the mix. Again, we have pitch, pan, and level, which allows us to turn the volume up and down, move it left and right, or change the pitch. And we can hit this keyboard button to allow us to play it via the pitch or the notes on our keyboard. And we have this button which changes it from a loop to a one-shot. Now, noise can be a little bit confusing to be adding to sounds at the beginning, in the, in, at, at the beginning but trust me, a little bit of noise can add a lot of energy and texture in your sounds, so I encourage you to test it out. Then finally, we have the sub-oscillator, which is always connected to oscillator A. So it's going to be, you know, a couple of octaves below or a couple of octaves above, whatever the pitch of oscillator A is. And again, we have the panning and level and varying wave shapes to choose from. So just the basic ones here on the sub-oscillator. Now, one important thing to note is if you find your patch is getting a little bit intense and a little bit gritty and the bass isn't coming through as much as you might like, try clicking this direct out. What this does is it bypasses the filter and the effects to make the sub go directly out in a much cleaner signal, which can oftentimes make your low end a lot thicker. Next up, we have the filter. And we can enable it simply by turning it on here and routing it to our various sound sources. So we can turn it on and off each independent sound source as well by clicking these buttons here. I personally like having it routed to all of them, but there can be benefits for testing it out. So try them out. Then as far as changing the filter types, it's the same thing as we've seen before. We have these arrow keys here, or we have our drop-down menu that allows us to choose from. Now there's a lot of different filter types to choose from, so I encourage you to just test them all out. I'm going to create another video that goes into a lot more detail about the different kind of filters and the pros and cons to each of them. But for now, I find the easiest way to understand them is the blue part is what's being affected by the filtering. So if we see outside of the line here, the blue stuff here, this is being cut out or filtered out. But this blue section here is where we can see it's inside the filter line, so this is actually being boosted. And as we move it, we can see those patterns change. The blue over here is being cut, 
the blue over here is being boosted here. So we can think about it anywhere there's a blue band on our graph here, that's where the frequency is being affected, either boosted or removed or cut, depending on where it is in the line. If it's inside the graph, it'll be boosting. If the blue is outside the graph, then it'll be cutting it out. And so again, I'll be creating a, a video a little bit more directly on the different filter shapes and how they function, but I find that's an easy way to understand the blue is what is being affected by the filter. Next, we have the cutoff knob and the resonance. And what those do is essentially move the position and shape the position of the filter. So we can see as we move the cutoff, it changes what frequencies are being affected. And we'll see. As I open and close it, it starts to sound brighter or darker. And the reason being is because more high frequencies, or a lot more high frequencies in a mix, tend to, tend to allow us to perceive that sound as brighter. But more low frequencies and less high frequencies in a mix will make us perceive that sound as a little bit darker. Next up we have resonance. And what resonance does is it creates a little bit of a, a boost right, off the, right at the cutoff point. So we can see here, visually, as we add the resonance, it starts to create this little bit of an aggressive EQ curve right there. And as we remove it, it smoothens it out. So a little bit of resonance can go a long way for fattening up the sound and, and adding a little bit of a whistling peak. But a lot of it can get a little assertive and aggressive real quick. Right, that's just far too much harmonics outside of what we're dealing with. So a little bit can go a long way. Next up we have pan, which is important to understand that pan functions differently than the pan on the oscillators. Rather than panning the sound left or right, what it does is it filters the sound separately on the left channel and the right channel to open and close the filter in opposite ways. Listen. So we can see, rather than moving the sound left and right, it actually opens and closes, opening up high frequencies and closing the high frequencies separately in the left and right channel, creating a very different sense of, of stereo image, which can be very cool and helpful. Next up, we have the drive and the fat knob. What the drive knob does is it boosts the incoming signal to create a sense of distortion as you boost it or as you increase it. Next up we have the fat knob, and the manual actually refers to this as the variable knob because it does a bunch of different things depending on which filter type you have selected. So it doesn't always do the same thing, and not every filter type is actually affected by the variable knob. So make sure to play around with it and hear what it's doing because it's going to be different on a filter by filter basis. And one thing to note about the drive and fat knob is that as we increase it, the loudness generally will increase on our patch. Listen. See how it gets a little bit louder? So that's important and we're gonna have to compensate for that as we increase the volume, just to make sure we don't clip or peak later on. Next up, I wanna look at the modulation section. Now this section may look a little bit daunting because it's just graphs and knobs here, but we're gonna break it down into a way that's easy to digest. So we're gonna start off by looking at envelope one here because envelope one is automatically connected to the master volume of the synth or the amplitude envelope as we call it. And as we can see, there's this graph here and that graph is connected to these knobs down here. And this is the entire section of our envelope. These five knobs along with these gra this graph that functions along with these knobs. So I encourage you, if you have no idea what ADSR means at this point, you, know, to, you can click around, move things, and just use your ear to test out how it sounds. But obviously, it's a whole lot easier to understand how to get the sound you want when you kind of understand what these different stages and these knobs mean. So we're going to break those down into a way that we can really understand and utilize them to the way we want. So the first thing I want to point out is the fact that everything here is measured in time. Milliseconds, milliseconds, seconds, milliseconds, except for this sustain knob. And we're gonna come back to that, but that's a very important distinction, is that these are all time-based events. This is a 
volume or a level-based event. So it's important. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. But first, let's start off going through the stage. How an envelope works is it is all in relation to when we hit a key on the keyboard. We can see this little ball moving. Anytime I hit a key on the keyboard, that triggers the envelope. Both envelope 1, envelope 2, and envelope 3, they're all connected to the keyboard. So when we hit the key, that triggers the envelope to turn on. Then what happens is once it turns on, it goes through the varying stages until it gets the end. So what are those stages? Well, let's go through them. The first stage is the attack, which is going to take 573 milliseconds for it to get to the max level once I hit the trigger or once I hit the key. So hit the key, 573 milliseconds to get to our max level. Then we have this hold volume, which we see as we stretch it out, it's a value in time as well. And we can turn that to be about a, a full second or as much or as little as we want. And essentially what that determines is how long in time does it stay at that max level before moving on to the next stage, the decay stage. So again, hit the attack. We can see it goes up for half a second, stays for a full second, then moves on to the decay stage, which is one second. Now, the decay and sustain, I find, is where people can get often tripped up in, in envelopes. But looking at the time-based and the level-based differential here is really what can separate the two of them. So, right, decay is a time-based event, but sustain is a, is a level-based event. So that's where they really differ. So, again, if it goes from the attack stage to the hold stage in a, in a second and a half, then it takes a full second to go through the decay stage. And what the decay stage suggests is it's going to take one second to lower the level down 16 dBs, right? So let's go up half a second, stay for a second, down a second. Now we went down 16 dBs in this range here. Now the sustain is going to stay at this level for as long as I hold down the key. I can even adjust this up to make it louder or down to make it quieter as, we, as we're holding down the key because the sustain will remain in action for as long as we hold down the key. And then as soon as we let go of the key, that's when the release stage is enabled and it takes that second or two seconds to ring out, however long we have it. So again, we can see the stages hit the key, it goes half a second attack, a full second hold, a full second decay, then in that second it's reducing its volume 20 decibels or it's reducing its amount 20 decibels, and then as soon as I let go of the key, it releases for half a millisecond or half a second before going into nothing. Now remember, this is connected to volume, but we can have multiple envelopes and connect them to more than just volume. By clicking and dragging to varying knobs, we can route this envelope to different articles or different items on our, on our, on our synth, like our filter cutoff. <laughs> We can see now the filter and the amplitude are both being affected by this envelope. Now that brings me into another little conversation here about the modulation matrix. Now as soon as you route something, like we did to the filter cutoff here, we can see if we go to the matrix tab, it automatically connects it and populates it in here. Now this can be a little bit confusing for the beginners, so usually I, I encourage them to look at it in this setting here, but it's important to understand that this is where all your modulation information is populating, and I'll go over this in a lot more detail in the intermediate video. But for starters, I find it's a lot easier and simple to navigate in the oscillator tab by simply making sure you're hovering or clicked on the, the modulation source that is affecting something. Then you can see this knob here has this little blue bar, which we can then move left or right to basically tell us where we want the, mo where we want the modulation to move, left or right. creating different sounds. And similarly, we can hit shift option to make it a bipolar LFO or an LFO that, or an envelope that goes both ways rather than one. You see, so we can completely change the way the envelope or the way the modulation source is affecting sound by simply changing this blue bar around a little bit. And again, we can see it in this modulation tab here as well but I find the visual aspect of this to be a little bit easier for beginners. Another important thing to note 
is if we hover over the blue bar that indicates the automation over here, we can right-click it to bypass it or remove it or do any of the editing we might need. So you can see you really can do all your modulation editing within the oscillator tab. So again, envelopes are within relation to when we hit the key and then it follows this pattern. And we have three of them that can do completely independent things, which can get very fun and very complex. So use them all, use as little as you want, don't be shy. Next up in our modulation source is the LFOs. Now these, rather than being in relation to when we hit the key, they can be a little bit more random or a little bit more sporadic. So let's take a look at what this mode function does here, because the LFO is going to function very differently depending on which mode we have. First mode we have is trigger, which functions kind of like an envelope in that any time we hit the key, the LFO will reset. Now we won't see the bar, the dot moving around the LFO yet until we route it to something to actually have some movement. So let's go route it to the drive just a little bit to get a little bit of movement and we're not going to make it too extreme by changing our modulation amount here. Now we can see that this bar is moving around as the LFO is turning. So with trigger enabled, anytime we hit the key, the LFO does reset but what happens with an LFO is it constantly cycles around and around and around. The envelope just goes one and done. The LFO is constantly cycling. And with trigger, the LFO may reset every time we hit a new key. But it still resets and cycles every time as long as we don't hit a new key. Then we have envelope mode, which functions exactly as an envelope does. And finally, we have the off mode which really just allows the LFO to be free-forming no matter where, no matter when, no matter how I hit the key, the LFO is always functioning behind the scenes and it'll just pick up wherever it is at the moment of you hitting the key, right? We can see this with the bar moving around. And again, routing the LFO is just like the envelope. We click this, drag it, and we can determine the amount we want through dialing in this little blue bar. we go now we're starting to get a bit of movement next up is this section here which really all correlates to the timing or the tempo of the song so with bpm not enabled we see we're relative in a hertz value and the lfo rate is just a complete speed dependent on hertz but if we have bpm enabled then it's all in relation to the tempo of our song so if we're in 120 bpm this will be a quarter note of 120 BPM and so forth, right? We can see that this bar changes, this rate changes from a bar to a Hertz value as we change this, right? These are seconds. These become quarter notes and subdivisions of our tempo, right? As we hit anchor, what happens with anchor is no matter what, the BPM of the LFO will always be synced to the tempo of our song. Even if we hit a note in between the grid, it will anchor it to the tempo of the song. So with Anchor on, the LFO will be much more in lock with the tempo of your song. So if you find that the LFO is shaking a little bit, turning the Anchor on can be very beneficial at locking it on grid. But this only works if you have BPM enabled. Next up, we have triplets and dots, which also only function if BPM is enabled. And they just change the groove or the swing of the LFO, essentially. Then we have these two knobs here, rise and delay. What rise does is it creates a little bit of a ramp up where the LFO is affecting more and more and more until it reaches max volume. So it'll take half a note, quarter note, or a full note depending on what you have this set at, right? So let's hear how that sounds. So you can see with the rise all the way at zero, the LFO just starts off instantly. But with the rise a little bit higher, it starts ramping up. You can see rather than just right, just completely more smooth of a buildup. Then we have the delay, which sets a, a timed amount or a grid-based amount for how long it waits before any of this LFO even starts. So it'll go through the delay then it'll go through the rise, and then it'll reach the max volume of our LFO, right? So the way we have it set now is it'll wait an eighth note, 
then rise for a half note, and then it'll stay at our LFO rate. You can see it waits, it pauses, then it builds, and then it stays. And that's how it's, that's what these knobs do. They sort of allow us to build in or build up to our LFO. Then we have this smoothness knob here, which basically helps when you're dealing with very fast LFO rates that are just buttering around like very quickly. They can just smoothen it out to get rid of these digital artifacts that happen at these very fast LFO rates. Listen. Hear how it just gets a little bit smoother as you bring this knob up and a little bit harsher as you bring it down. One final thing to note about the LFO is the LFO shape. And there's two different ways I suggest beginners going about this. One is to simply draw your own, and we can change our curves like that, or double click to add modulation points to basically change it however we want. But one important thing to note about modulation is that simple can oftentimes go a long way. So one thing I suggest is if we click this little folder here, we can choose from a bunch of different presets that can be very effective for finding some very simple yet versatile modulation to choose from. So I suggest checking them out. Next up we have this voicing section. This mono knob allows us to only play one note at a time. This is very beneficial for basses and leads because sometimes you don't want other notes stepping on the main note that you're playing. So this can be very helpful for clarity. Then we have this poly section here which allows us to determine how many notes we can play. So with one note poly, we can only play one note at a time. With three note polyphony or poly, we can only play three notes at a time. You can see as I start to increase the notes and play more, it just cuts out the bottom one. Yeah, a little crackly, so it's increased the smoothness. And we're peaking, so this is good. A little side note as well, if you ever see the red bar going up here, that means your volume is too loud and you should just turn down the master because that's going to be clipping and it won't be good for the sound. There we go, now we can see we're getting rid of those little artifacts that we were hearing before. So, good tip for you, if you ever are hearing some crackly sounds that you can't quite figure out, Check to see if your master is peaking, and just turn the volume down, because odds are that's the reason. So now that we've sort of figured that out, we can go back to our voicing and our polyphony, right? With three note polyphony, I can only play three notes at a time. As I start playing more notes on top of that, it just cuts out the other notes. That's what it does. The polyphony determines how many notes the synth can play at one time. Next up, we have this portamento section, which allows us to determine the time in milliseconds for gliding between notes. So if you listen with portamento not enabled, it just plays the notes one, 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 one. But with portamento enabled, we can hear it'll start to glide between the pitches. You can hear it starts sort of gliding in between those notes. This is a very exciting way to sort of blend your patches or blend your, your, your notes together, I mean. But the important thing to understand is unless this always knob is enabled, the glide will only happen if you're playing the note in succession. So holding down the one note and then playing the other, right? Take a look down at the keyboard. I'm holding down this note. If I let go of the note before, before playing the next one, the glide won't actually happen. Right, it just goes from one note to another. But if I hold down the notes, then we get that glide. But with always enabled, glide will happen no matter what. Even if we let go of the keys, the glide will still happen. So, it's important to understand that this knob can really help your glide sound a lot different depending on whether it's enabled or not. So, test it out. 
So essentially, we've gone through all the basics of sound design at this point. We've created our patch, and really all we did was go through the sound sources, the filters, and the modulation. But look at where we ended up. Right, pretty exciting patch. Now, the final thing I want to talk about in this video is the effects section. So, each one of these essentially deserves their own video, so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail in what these all do, but I encourage you to just test them out, try them out, and experience. The one thing I want to really emphasize is that the order of the signal chain matters. So depending on whether reverb is at the front of the chain or at the back of the chain, it will be functioning and shaping the sound differently. So test it out, move them around and experiment with different orders. The one way I like to think about FX's is they're kind of like spices for your sound. Even though we already have our main sound here, right? It still can be added. We have the core of it, but we can still add a whole lot of excitement. So just try out some different effects and see which ones you like. we go, I'm liking that order. There we go. Now, the final thing we need to do is once we've created a patch we're happy with, we, we'd want to save it. So the easy way to do that is hit this little hard drive save disk here, and then choose the folder we want to. I just have the default preset section here for Serum, and label it. Let's call this... Base pad drone idea. Oh, missed an E. Base pad drone idea. Not too sure what to call it, but that'll work. And save it there. And there we go. Now we've gone through all the basics of Serum and created ourselves a patch. So hopefully this video answered a few questions and clarified a few things, but if there's still any questions remaining, please don't hesitate to send them in the comment. If you liked the video, please like and subscribe because there's a lot more of these videos coming soon. Have a good one. Cheers.